All right, welcome everybody to a very special day of CSI 45. I'm actually pre-recording this because I'll be in the hospital while you guys are taking your lecture. So this is going to be a more traditional asynchronous lecture where I'm simply going to pre-record it for your amusement and later perusal. So the uh, first thing we need to talk about is your upcoming homework assignments. So as of today, Tuesday, um, you should have completed the first part of the physical computing assignment, made some simple circuits, turned some LEDs on, either in real life or using Tinkercad. And then your next part of that is going to be due on Friday at midnight. I pushed the deadline back a little bit so that we have time on Thursday to talk about it and kind of go over um, any questions you guys might have. But that assignment's pretty simple. It's what I talked about in the last class. You have to have two sensors. You're going to have your Raspberry Pi or the Arduino if you're doing it on Tinkercad. Read from these sensors, do some sort of computation. For example, um, you need to give it a story to. So, for example, if you're making a, a security box or something like that, you know, you might make it so that while the thing is tilted this way, you might have a tilt sensor. And while a magnet is applied to this, then it turns on a light and spins a motor or something like that. So, you have to have two sensors, you have to have a program that does something interesting. It doesn't have to be more than, I don't know, a couple lines of code besides the boilerplate to turn on the pins and things like that. Uh, somewhere between two and 12 lines of logic I'm not asking for. Very much here, just make it a little interesting. I want a little story. I want it to be cool. Uh, you guys don't get the experience of making the, the full-on projects this year, uh, but then I want to give you a little taste of it. So, you know, make, you know, make up a story. I'm making a... Uh, a device you get attached to the inside of a spaceship, and if there's explosive gases detected, it turns on a fan and signals a, 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 an alarm by flashing a red LED. Something cool. I don't really care. But just, you know, spice it up a little bit. So that'll be due Friday at midnight. Uh, there's one component that I didn't quite get to talk to you. Relays and transistors sort of in the same category we can talk about as well. So... Uh, one thing I did mention last time is that if you have the Raspberry Pi uh, sourcing the current for a DC motor, oftentimes when the DC motor spins up, it can dip the voltage enough on the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi reboots and your program stops running because it rebooted. Um, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It's not the kind of thing you want to hear as a computer science person. So uh, the right way of doing motors when working with a Raspberry Pi is to have a separate power circuit for it. So uh, typically when you have a Raspberry Pi working as a controller, uh, you're turning GPIO pins on and off, you're reading from sensors, you're turning pins on and off. Those things are just being used for control. So in other words, you turn on, you turn off, that kind of stuff. You can power an LED directly, but for anything big, um, you, you're not going to power a motorboat from your Raspberry Pi, you know what I mean? But the Raspberry Pi could be like, turn the motorboat on, send a voltage high. Okay, and so what allows you to go from send a voltage high on the Raspberry Pi to a motorboat turning on is something called a relay. A relay is like a remote controlled switch. So when the Raspberry Pi sends that high voltage, that high voltage gets read uh, on the input here. Um, I think the third pin here, it's kind of obscured by the arrow. Uh, you, you wire up the Raspberry Pi to the relay, ground five volts, you attach those out of a five volt pin out of your Raspberry Pi, out of a ground, out of your Raspberry Pi, hook those up. And then you have one of your GPIO pins you control where you can turn it high, turn it low, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, it does matter. Obviously, you don't want the motorboat racing off without you. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like you, 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 uh, you have a GPIO pin that you can uh, uh, control. And then when that GPIO pin goes high, uh, it reads a high voltage here, and then the relay here uh, is kind of an um, electromagnet. And so when it gets a little bit of a uh, uh, signal here, then the electromagnet slams over and it conducts a lot of electricity. It can conduct 10 amps, which is substantial, right? It's, it's actually um, probably more than you should be messing with right now, <laughs> especially since you're at home and I can't like observe your safety procedures. So I'm going to ask you guys not to mess with mains power. Uh, I'm sure you can see videos on YouTube on how you can like take a lamp and like cut the power cable and 
pull the uh, pull the wires out and run the wires through re relay, and then you can have a Raspberry Pi turn a desk lamp on and off. It's pretty cool. It's actually a really neat experience. I've actually got several of those stripped power cables in my house, and they, they work really nicely. Um, so how does it work? So this is the control side of things. When you have your Raspberry Pi hooked up to it, and you got a signal coming in here, a little LED will glow. Uh, there's a transistor that I'll explain those probably next. Uh, there's power, it's on or off, whatever, that doesn't matter. This is the part you hook up to the Raspberry Pi, then separate circuit. And that's really important. You want to have your uh, big power draining beasts uh, away from your delicate electronic controllers, okay? So these are separated circuits. Um, there's some things you might, you guys might have heard of called opto optocouplers, which um, I'll let you have two, uh, like if you have a high voltage, it'll send a high voltage, but there's no actual electrons going across it actually, yeah. And so um, you can isolate circuits so that if there's a lightning bolt or a, a big surge on one, it doesn't blow out your pipe. Um, the relay works the same way here. So what you have over here is you have three, and, and these things can be beefy lines too, because remember these things can hold 10 amps. Like you can you can get a, um, like a desk lamp, like I said, and get those big, thick uh, copper wires and feed them into these things. But we're not going to. For this class, just take the normal uh, dinky little wires we have, uh, like, and I showed you guys last time with that camel. This is dinky little wires, put one in here, one in here. So what are, why are there three wires? Well, glad you asked. The um, uh, when the switch is when the signal is low or the thing is off, then these two guys are connected elect electrically, electronically, right? So if you have a circuit coming in here, like a wire coming in here, and a wire coming out here, same wire, right? It's like a breadboard kind of. These two are connected by default. That's what NC stands for. It stands for uh, normally connected. If the signal goes high, then you'll hear a click. And again, it's electromagnet. Actually, there's a spring and a thing and it goes like this and it slams over. You can actually hear it thunk. Um, I remember reading sci-fi novels where they hear relays engaging and I always wondered what that meant. Well, after starting messing around with this stuff, like if you have a big industrial relay, you hear the thing go thunk like that as the electromagnet slams over. Uh, yeah. so. Yeah, or if you ever seen people like throwing switches down and things like that, that's kind of like a, a relay, but not an automatically controlled one. It's like there's an actual person running over and throwing a switch down to turn the power on. That would be a human relay, you know. Turn it on. Okay, yes, sir. And then the lights turn on. So when the signal goes high here, rather than these two wires being connected here, these two are. And so if you've got a circuit set up, you can, you can just ignore this if you want. It's generally uh, safer to not have things turn on when <laughs> your system's off, right? I mean, you, nothing's stopping you, but um, like if this was attached like a fan or something, it'd be really weird if you turned everything on and things spun up. And then once your system booted and the program ran, it stopped. And it'd be kind of weird. So usually we hook it up to the uh, uh, normally open, you know, branch here. So you have a wire coming in here and then a wire coming in here and you complete the circuit. And when the signal goes high, you're a thunk, and these two things are connected, and current flows. And so it's literally like uh, if my daughter is behind me, I said, Ada, turn off the light. Ada, turn on the light. That's a relay. It's just a, a remote-controlled switch. That's all it is. Signal goes high. These two guys are connected. Signal goes low. These two are disconnected. Okay. And so why? Well, uh, you want... Uh, to have a separate power source for your DC motors and things like that. So you might have, let's see if I can uh, copy image. Let's pull this into note. Who is this? Microcontrollers Lab. Thank you for your, your contribution. We appreciate you. All right. So 5321. Let's paste this in here. And this is a pretty standard relay. It's pretty much like the one you have in your um, uh, kits. Your super kits should have one. Uh, can I not move you? Come on, no. Can I move you? There we go. Thank you. Okay. So what's going to happen is let's go to the draw menu. Let's see how well one note works. Okay. So this is going to be run over to you. Got your 
Raspberry Pi, you got your GPIO pins over here. This is gonna be ground. This is gonna be hooked up to some ground wire. This one is gonna be hooked up to some five volt wire. And then this one will be hooked up to like, you know, some GPIO pin that you control. And so in your program, you, you say, hey, pin, GPIO pin, I don't know, four or something. Turn on, and then you'll hear a thunk. And then these two things connect. So let's say that we have over here a separate power source, right? Because the Raspberry Pi works as a power source. This is a circuit over here. Over here, we need a separate power source. So you can get a nine volt battery or something like that. And one side of that could go into here one wire can come out of here and then you can have like a little DC motor set up with like a fan attached to it or something like that over here and then that runs into there and so when the GPIO pin goes high you hear a click current flows through the circuit the fan turns on the Raspberry Pi goes off click the fan turns off and so by doing this this circuit here is all electronically isolated from your Pi it's not draining power from your Pi it's draining it from the battery and there's various uh, battery adapters and things like that you can buy if you'd like. Um, you probably just uh, touch the, the wire to the battery, to tape it on or something. If you don't have soldering kits and things like that. I watched one person like trying to do everything with their fingers today. It's like, you tape it, you know, it's not gonna kill anything. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that's a that's a, the most simple use of a, of a relay. And this could be coming from mains power. This could be coming out of your wall. Like I said, for this assignment, please don't. Um, I don't have, yeah. I don't want your death on my hands. <laughs> uh, okay, so how do these things here work? So you notice how this thing looks like a screwdriver? Uh, that's because it is. You're gonna need a screwdriver, a Phillips head screwdriver, a plus screwdriver, as they're called in some circles. And what you do is you, you screw the, the thing up and it comes up and you take the wire, you put it in there and you screw it down and then tug on it, make sure it's got a good connection. Do the same for the other one, tug on it. There you go, you're good to go. You don't have to do soldering. You can just screw the, the contact plate down and it should hold the wire good and firm. Uh, again, don't please don't come anywhere near these uh, tolerance limits. I've had students melt these things before, by the way. Like, I don't know how, but because these things like 10 amps times 250, that's 2.5 kilowatts. That's a lot of power running through this thing. And I, I don't know how they do it, but they, they, they've destroyed uh, relays before. So on a DC circuit, uh, 10 amps at 30 volts, which again, you shouldn't be anywhere near that. Um, so but that's still like 300 watts of power, which is pretty significant for a little toy thing. These things cost usually around a dollar or something like that. Uh, I typically buy sets of eight relays, and so there's like eight of them on a on a thing, and so you can control eight different devices, you know, using the eight-way relay. I got a whole stack of them for for you guys. Sorry. <laughs> Once again, um, coronavirus. So hey, good news. I don't have coronavirus. I got I got COVID tested on Sunday, and I don't I don't have I don't have the the Rona. So that's good. All right, um, that's about all there is to say about relays. It's pretty simple. I think a transistor, which is uh, that little guy there. A transistor, you've probably heard of transistors before. Like transistors are the fundamental building block of modern computing, right? Like, um, you know, a, a modern CPU has a billion transistors inside of it. And you're like, wait, a million of, billion of these things? Yeah, well, they used to be physical discrete transistors. Like if you ever look at a transistor radio, um, let's see if they have a inside of a transistor radio that we can look at. My aunt told me uh, the best way of learning how to uh, do electronics is to break you know, devices open and tear them apart and reassemble them. So, um, yeah, I, I tore one of her clocks apart and it didn't get back together. And she never asked me to do that again. Kind of weird. <clears throat> Maybe you shouldn't be asking a five-year-old. Okay, so uh, here we got something. Uh, these are some big giant caps they got on here. These are capacitors. Capacitors are like uh, 
temporary batteries. They can hold charge in them. Don't touch a cap with your finger. Don't lick it. Uh, they can hold charge even when the device is off. They're like a battery. And if you touch it, it could discharge into your finger and, you know, give you a bad time. So, um, yeah, these, these big cylindrical things are, are capacitors. Um, it always, uh, it was interesting to me, like a, a Nintendo, the original N Nintendo Entertainment System, if you unplugged it and you hit the power button, the power button would actually turn on for a second. And then it would turn off. It's like, wait, how does it have power without it being plugged in? It's because there's caps on the inside of it, capacitors on the inside. Then when you hit the power button, it discharges into the circuit and the light, there's enough current for the light to turn on briefly and then it turns off again. So uh, there's more things. That's a small capacitor. That's a resistor. Anyhow, some, somewhere inside of here, there's going to be a transistor. Let's see, 1959, final inspection, okay. So we got a speaker. Speakers are actually pretty simple things. Uh, I think your super kit has a speaker with it and you could probably rig it up to make to make sound. It's, um, just uh, set up one of your pins to go high and low of, and different fre frequencies and see what happens. Um, yeah, somewhere in here there's a... Uh, I'm not really familiar with 1959 technology, but um, let me show you guys what a modern transistor looks like. This is kind of cool though. I've never looked at this kind of stuff before. But yeah, I mean, honestly, the, the notion is you can actually just sit there and trace. Uh, you can see the solder on here and you can see the, where the wires are on the printed circuit board. Um, that's a wire, essentially. It's a doped version of, silicon is by default a non-conductor, but if you dope it with right ions, then it forms a conductor and so that is a wire and you can flip it over and you can trace out all the connections and, and actually figure out how these things work. Um, let's see, transistor radio kit. Let's see if we can see. Yeah, so they sell these things like Radio Shack, rest in peace. So you can... Um, breadboard out a radio and that's a, just a long piece of wire. It's an antenna probably tuned to different frequencies. Use a pentometer, a nine volt battery powering the thing. You can probably trace this thing out. Um, that's probably volume is my guess. Where is the, oh, these are transistors here. Okay. So it's like there's three transistors here. Now transistors are, they, they serve kind of two similar but different functions. So a transistor works as a switch. And so uh, like that was the thing that we just saw in the previous thing, except put into the breadboard. So a, an MPN transistor, but there's also PNP and it, the only difference is whether they turn on, we give them a high voltage or a low voltage. It basically doesn't matter. They're the same thing, just in reverse. And, uh, and so, uh, let's see if we have it. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So you send a, you send a, a, a signal to it and then it turns on. <laughs> it's like a relay. It basically, you give it a high voltage and, uh, then the, uh, let's make sure I get this correct. Base, 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 triggers and controls. So if you, uh, uh, if you supply a high voltage to it, then current flows, supply a low voltage, it turns off. It's a relay. So what's the difference between a relay and a transistor? Well, uh, there's a second part of a transistor we'll get to in a second, but basically, um, the, the difference is in the sorts of uh, loads they carry, right? So transistor can turn on and off very, very quickly. This is a semiconductor device, right? You can, 
if you have a, a voltage going high and a voltage going low, the transistor will turn on. It'll turn off, uh, depending on the, your characteristics. Um, you know, maybe you know millions or billions of times a second, right? So you have a transistor that turns on and turns off very, very quickly. Whereas a relay is a spring and a magnet, and it, and you hit a thing and it's a slams over and then you turn it off and it slams back and you turn it on again it slams over you can do it maybe in two times a second and you're probably going to burn out your your relay if you're doing that all day long like it'll it'll wear out right relays are not designed to be uh turned on and off really quickly it's like flicking a switch on your you know your parents uh light switch right it, you get tired of that real fast, right? The, the physical contacts will wear out. So transistors can turn on. Wow, it's really bitter. Transistors can turn on and off really quickly, but they can't carry as much current. So the um, They have the the maximum amps of a NPM transistor max amp. Five hundred milliamps, right? So half an amp, whereas the relay holds ten amps, right? Pretty pretty significant difference. Like a relay can hold a lot more current. Because remember, this thing's a giant magnet smashing over, and there's a big, beefy bus, essentially, that you're, you're touching. A lot of current can flow through it. Transistor, you'll blow it out, right, if you try pushing 10 amps through a little, little BB transistor like that. So, you know, there's different needs for different circumstances. If you uh, have ever started a car, right, if you've ever started a car, and you turn the key in your car, you hit the button if you have a fancy car, what you're, what you're doing there is you're not actually um, starting the car directly, right? There's a starter in your car, and the starter is like a motor that turns your bigger motor, your, your engine, right? So it's an, it's an electric motor that starts your, your car. It starts turning everything, and then it, vroom, you know, and then the, then the starter turns off. So you hold the, the key down, you know, if you ever had a bad car like me, you know, that's the electric motor trying to turn your, your car. And if you have a problem with like, uh, you know, the air intake, not getting enough oxygen, then the thing will have trouble starting or if you flooded your engine. Um, so the electric motor is attached to your car battery. And so the, the way that a car starts, so you didn't know this was an automotive class. Huh? Um, you've got your, uh, let's see, your steering wheels here, right? Then you got your, uh, your key right here. So your key goes in here, you turn it, right? And so there's a, a wire that runs this way. Not a, not a especially thick wire either. Thick wires are actually kind of expensive and harder to, to run. And so they actually has a nice thin little wire that runs over here. And then you've got your car battery, which is a big honking battery. Like that, like uh, those things pack a punch, right? You don't want to lick those things, right? Um, especially with the acid inside of it, right? And so what you have is you've got your your electric motor here, which is attached to your car engine. I'm not really sure what I'm drawing here anymore. But this is like an electric motor. Motor. You've got your battery, but the battery doesn't just attach to the motor because then it would just be on all the time, right? It would just be a circuit and it'd be on all the time. So instead, what happens is your um, when you turn the key, it goes to what's called an automotive relay. automotive relay and that carries a huge amount of uh, current from your battery to the motor and then when you let off on the key the the relay turns off it opens the circuit and the electric motor stops running then hopefully your car is now running at that point All right so you turn the thing it completes the circuit current flows between the battery a lot of current on thick wires runs between the the battery and the electric motor the motor spins your, your car engine, your car starts, you let off on the key, this kicks clicks off, and you're good to go. And that's how you start a car. 
And so, um, so do 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 uh, automotive relay. So these things are a lot bigger. Right? I have some of them, I think. They're big, these are big relays, right? So it's resource limit is reached. Oh, that's unfortunate. All right, relays, switches, and relays. All kinds of electronic, electromagnetic power relays, fuse box. Heavy duty relay switch. Yeah. So these guys hold 30 amps. Okay. And uh, yeah, don't run your little Arduino <laughs> relay through these guys. Let's see here uh, 30 or 40 amps. Fuel injection main relay. Let's see, what is the. Doesn't tell you. doesn't tell you what the amps are. Anyhow, so the um, yeah, automotive relays are, are bigger and bulkier than a Arduino relay. Uh, they also probably can't turn on and off as quickly because they're bulkier. At the same time, arguably, you know, turning your car on 20 times a second, I don't think so, you know. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a beefy, beefy thing. So, all right, so that's that's basically how you start a car. You know, it's the same same concept. And so a transistor basically works the same way as a relay. You the, the basic function of a transistor is you say turn on and then it turns on a circuit. You say turn off and the circuit turns off. That's function one. So transistors do two things. Transistors do two things. First, they work as a relay. Right? Turn on. Okay. Turn off. Okay. And second, they're used for amplification. Right, so if you have a uh, transistor and you feed in uh, increasing, let's say you go from zero to I don't know, five volts, whatever the tolerance is for max, um, what you'll see is the output voltage of the, uh, of the thing will look like this and it'll kind of cap out after a time. And so you can use it to get a higher voltage out than your voltage in and so you can and if it's got a separate power source, then congratulations, you've built a transistor radio because that's all a transistor radio is. It takes an input signal from an antenna and boosts the gain on it. And the slope here is the gain, the rise over run, or, yeah, is the gain, how much boost you get out of it. And so as long as you're operating in this area here, then uh, it, it works as an amp, okay? And uh, if you're working out over here where you're, it's either on or it's off, then it's a relay, right? Because over here it's on, you know, it's on, and over here it's off. But when you're kind of operating in this area, uh, it's it's functioning as an amp. And in fact, uh, musicians like um, using uh, vacuum tubes. Vacuum tubes are kind of a kind of similar concept. Um, I always thought a vacuum tube had something to do with vacuum cleaners, and and that's not actually the case. When I was a kid, I had a vacuum tube amp. You take it out of a vacuum cleaner. Um, so these things are like um, old timey transistors, right? um, and uh, yeah, they were replaced by the transistor in the 1960s. Yeah. And then uh, yeah, and so some people still use these things as amps. And uh, nowadays you can get amps um, emulators that will simulate the vacuum tubes in them but um yeah early computers were actually built using these things because uh, like in csi 26 we talked about how you can put transistors together to make uh, and or and not gates and with and or and not gates you can make anything you can make a bit of memory uh you can yeah well, you know basically once you got that you can make anything and so um so if you um designing or gate using transistors. Okay, they're doing it by hand. That's okay, cool. Um, yeah, all right, well, that's a little extreme. But yeah, so basically, um, yeah, that's way overkill. Right purpose, yeah. So basically you've got uh, and two inputs, A and B. If they're both true, the output is true. If either of them are true, the output's true. 
So the current can either flow through the first transistor or the second transistor or both. If they're both off, then no current flows. If either of them is on, current flows. And there you go. Two transistor gives you an OR gate and then you can build similar things for the NOT gate, for the AND gate, da 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 da. Right, so the AND gate, they're in series, the OR gate, they're in parallel, basically. And so they both have to be on for the AND gate to allow current to flow with the OR gate. Either of them is on and current will flow. And then you can build everything else. The NOT gate is just one that inverts the um, voltage. And so, uh, and a diode is kind of just, or a buffer, you know, however you want to put it, is just the output's the same as the input. So, yeah, so between and or not, you can basically build anything in computer science. Good on you. Uh, like I said, there's NPN and PNP transistors, and the only difference really is whether they turn on if you have a high voltage or a low voltage. There's probably some, you know, electrical engineers out there that are throwing their shoes at the monitor right now, but um, yeah, I'm a computer science person. That's the main difference. It's it's mostly just in my, in my experience in building these things, whether it'd be more convenient for me to run a ground to it or a five volt is really the only difference that I've ever cared about. Don't get mad at me, electrical engineers. I got an A minus in electrical engineering, <laughs> or thereabouts. Okay, so yeah, with transistors you can basically build anything. Um, Transistor amplifier, uh, not what I wanted. There we go. All right. Um, yeah, so at the output, yeah. So you can see there's this gain on it. I think this might be inverted. But either way, um, yeah. So you can see how it, it amplifies um, circuits and things like that. So, yeah, you can uh, you can build an app if you're a guitar enthusiast. You can build apps using transistors or vacuum tubes. Um, let's see if there's a niche app audio files. Yeah, there you go. 70 watt hybrid tube hybrid audio amplifier selling for $2,680. About 10 times the price of a comparable model using transistors. Yeah. So there you go. If you if you are an audiophile and you like spending 10 times the amount of money for something, knock yourself out. <laughs> um, tube sound, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, nowadays, like I said, there's uh, amp um, emulators that can kind of do that for you, but yeah, um, like metalheads like get really into that whole aspect of things, and uh, yeah, not not really my scene. So that's uh, that's that, and so you can basically use a transistor for low amperage things the same way you use it as a relay. So if you want to turn a LED on using a separate power source, you can do that using a transistor. Um, if you want to do some little amplification stuff, yeah, go for it. All right, so you know, on the physical computing side, mostly I think at this point, uh, you've got your kits, um, maybe some things are missing from it that might guide you on what sort of project you do because um it was a pandemic last year and the students just came by and just went here you go and just dropped stuff off and it's not been inventoried so you might not have a relay who knows it's it's all part of the fun and surprise of computer science 45 in a pandemic so some of you don't have raspberry Pis either so uh yeah the uh the thing to do on friday just two inputs two outputs you know, just go through go through your kit, see what you got, and put something together. Let the source code guide you. Uh, look at the example source code from the SunFounder people. Um, I've shown you where to get that before. 
Uh, the links are up on Canvas. And basically just start with that. And once you get once you're reading something from the, the sensor, you're pretty much good to go. Uh, the only um, caveat again is if you if when you're looking at the SunFounder site it says you need an analog to digital converter, you can only have one of those without purchasing additional stuff. So don't don't attach two analog sensors. Attach one. Max. You can do zero, I guess, if you want. Because that needs to be hooked up to the I2C port. There's certain pins on your Raspberry Pi. Ah, that's better. There's certain pins on your Raspberry Pi listed as I2C. That is your serial data in and out. That's what the analog to digital converter needs to attach to. You've also got uh, one or two PWM uh, wires that can be used to control uh, DC motors faster or slower. So if you uh, do PWM out, um, you can turn LEDs on brighter or dimmer, run a DC motor faster or slower by doing PWM, which is going to simulate an analog output. It's not really analog, it's just digital turning on and off really fast. Um, what was that website I looked at? Raspberry Pi G Pi G Pi. Yeah, there we go. Okay. So, that's serial data, doesn't matter. No C, master out, slave in, master in, slave out. Um, programming in E, prom, PWM zero, PWM one. And uh, you, you might um, run into issues with PWM if you try doing multiple ones Let's see what's the reason um i think it used the hardware interrupt so you remember how i told you guys about interrupts and interrupt handlers and things like that and signal and all that kind of stuff where you can have an interrupt activate one of the interrupts you can create is called an alarm and so you can create a, a alarm that says in three seconds send me an interrupt sig alarm and the uh, the way PWM works, and I might be confusing this with our Arduino, so don't don't hold me to it, is that it actually sets an alarm that triggers every so often, and then it, uh, when the alarm triggers, it flips the bit from high to low, basically, and if you have two of them, then the alarms are going off, and I, again, it's been a while since I had that problem, so I I, I don't actually remember if it was on our Arduino or Raspberry Pi. Basically, I had issues with two of them going because they would interfere with each other because the alarms would be going off. And, um, and like, uh, um, just things broke. And so with one PD of them, it was fine. With two of them, it caused chaos. So, um, yeah. Uh, may or may not happen to you. I don't know. Just be careful. You might want to just do one PD of them, PWM output for safety. Okay. Um... Let's see if we can get some information. No, no, PWM one. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, um, ITC is what your uh, analog to digital controller be hooked up to, um, and you got your five volt and yeah. Okay. So JTAG is uh, the hardware debugging, um, and. Uh, this, this is like how electrical engineers uh, do their uh, see out uh, debugging, <laughs> kind of, so to speak. Um, you know, in computer science, you're supposed to use a debugger, and like everybody just uses like see out, I'm here right now, you know, and you're just looking at the thing scrolling past, see where it crashes, you know. Um, JTAG is a um, standardized debugging format for electrical engineers, basically. And um, when I worked on a project with electrical engineers building a device, they decided not to build any sort of debugging uh, test leads into their hardware. And so why? They figured it would work right the first time is why. Yeah, they'd gone over the design. Everything looked good. We'll save some money by not building any debugging things on there. And so when it didn't work, they had no idea why. And they spent a year 
uh, poking at the thing because they couldn't build out another test port for some reason. I guess they ran out of money on that. And so they had this $100,000 chunk of junk, I guess, because it wouldn't really do anything. And they were, you know, I just always watch electrical engineers over there, like poking at things with multimeters and hooking them up to oscilloscopes and things like that. And they never figured out what was wrong. So I eventually just moved on to another project. They're paying me to do nothing. They're paying me to be on call for when they get it working any day now, it's going to get working. We're going to need you because I had ported my software from C++ to C to run on this particular device they had built. And uh, they paid me to just hang out, you know, and I would play Quake. And then I got yelled at by the system administrators for playing Quake in, on the university's network. How dare you, sir? And I was like, well, what else do you want me to do here? I'm just you know, twiddling my thumbs, you know, just sit in the corner, stare at the wall. Sounds great. Sounds great for about half an hour. And then after that, you get really bored. And I, I actually was starving to death then because I, even though I had a good paying job and they would pay me as many hours as I wanted to come in and stare at a wall, like it was brutal. Like I could not, I could not bring myself to do it. It was brutal. And so, yeah, all that was because they did not put in debugging. <sighs> Shame too. No, it was a cool project. Wireless video conferencing for the military. Yeah, it was a cool project. Never went anything. Never went anywhere. Headed by a guy from Qualcomm. You know. Had admirals come out and they're joking about what color the box would be. You know, gray for the Navy, blue if it was Air Force. And they had a general from the Air Force there and they're all nodding along. And no, nope, nothing ever happened. It was a worthless brick of silicon. Yeah, so that was a physical computing project that did not go well. <clears throat> so always... <laughs> Always have the humility to understand that your, your stuff might not work. All right. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, big, big news is uh, there will be one final assignment after Friday. So during finals week, I'm going to give you guys a small assignment to do during finals week. The final is not going to be a big deal. It's like, was it 10% of your grade? Something like that. Uh, but I do, I do want you to get a little more experience doing this physical computing stuff. So I'm going to give you guys one more project. I'm going to give you guys, I, right now I'm, I'm thinking of three different options or four different options. See what I got right now. So option one is something physical computing, but bigger. Bigger than what is due on Friday. Option two is, what was option two? Oh yeah, open CV. So OpenCV is cool, and I've, I've actually done projects with it the last uh, two or three years. Um, so OpenCV is image recognition. The trouble is I don't know where the Raspberry Pi cameras are, because again, there has not been a inventory. So one of you might have all 10 of them. I don't know where they are. So the school bought a, a class set of cameras, 10 of them, because there's 10 project groups. I don't know where they are. So uh, the good news is you don't have to do this on the Raspberry Pi. It'll work just fine on your PC. If you have a webcam or something like that, uh, you can do an OpenCV project. What is OpenCV? Good question. So OpenCV is a, um, a really big thing, actually. It's it's quite, quite huge. Um, it's used for a lot of things. The... Uh, tutorial image processing <laughs> GPU accelerated computer vision yeah I've been wanting to do this for a while I've been wanting to do CUDA with you guys for a while maybe we can do that um, video input with OpenCV and similarity measurement of the GPU uh, examples maybe Face detect. There we go. Okay, so um, so OpenCV can identify uh, different objects. Like if you have a dog run past, it could be like that's a dog, that's a cat. That was actually in a, a a summer project that they assigned at MIT in the '60s, and it took 40 years until people actually got a classifier to work that could identify a dog and a cat successfully. They thought it would be just like a couple months of work. Nope, turns out to be really hard. And so OpenCV can do that though. 
it's free and open source. And so uh, you can just feed it uh, a webcam thing, and here it's identifying the person's eyes and their face. And uh, so you can do that uh, for your project. Don't just run an example thing. I want you to do something with it. But you know that's that's the basic idea. There, uh, you can see OpenCV and like uh, driving, like. Uh, Autonomous vehicles and things like that. Real-time lane detection using OpenCV. Um, yeah, this kind of stuff. It can identify other cars on the road. It can identify your lane, other cars. It's figuring out how the lane radius is 4.7 kilometers, so fairly smooth turn. Uh, two close vehicles. Yeah, And so there's all sorts of really cool stuff, and I would like for you guys to get some experience with it because uh, it's used all over the place now. And a lot of these machine learning and you know autonomous vehicle things um, use, use it. You know? So it's identifying road signs and stuff like that. Cool stuff. You can run in real time. The Raspberry Pi kind of is almost a little underpowered for it, but uh, the Pi 4 is a pretty decent machine. So um, the Pi 2 is definitely chugged when it, when it came to this. Okay. Um, so you can do an open CV project. Um, again, these things aren't really to kill you. It's finals week, so you know it's it's not like I, I really want you to dump too much time into it. I just want you to kind of do something cool, and so download one of the examples and modify it a little bit. You know, it's kind of the idea that I have. Three, do something with bridges. Uh, anything you like with bridges. Uh, the uh, bridges UNCC website has example code. not that one this one and so uh, you can do it in assembly or yeah I think assembly would be good um, just do you know they, they've got different data sets and they've got different examples so again just uh, find one of their examples and do it in assembly it's not too bad they've got an API you call the API from assembly you guys know that glue by now the extra and C and all that kind of stuff to get everything working right and um, you know, like uh, do uh, dev games stuff like that. And let's see documentation, download reference. Um, where is the? There we go. Shapes games, non-blocking game. So check out the documentation for non-blocking game. Yeah, so you can do you can do things like this. Like you, you can actually have your assembly program controlling Snake. Do you guys know Snake? Uh, snake again. <clears throat> so Snake is a game where you just move a block around, and then every time it eats food, it gets bigger. And so the trouble is that you run and you can run into your own tail and die. And so you can uh, do this. I guess maybe C++ might be the way to go for this. But um, you can make a, um, a uh, interactive game. Falling Sand, I did this in, um, I did this in uh, ISFDB last Friday, I believe. How, how to simulate sand and water and stuff like that. So you do them in bridges. So that'd be cool. Um, while there's no master gamepad support, you can use WASD and arrow keys and stuff like that. So uh, yeah, Pyth uh, the, the bridges non-blocking game, I'd like to see at least some of you guys do that. Each one of you can pick your own, so you don't have to, you don't have to go with the class. Let's throw that in there. So physical computing, OpenCV, bridges, and then um, fourth option. Chess and assembly. I'd like to see somebody do that. Program a working chess client in assembly. I was uh, reading a um, news article about a, a student at, uh, I think, Oxford or Cambridge who built an AI and everything 
all the graphics, everything in assembly. I don't expect that from you guys. Just be able to input moves. That's it. So knight to, you know, a3 or whatever, you know, that's it. And just have a working set of rules for chess, you know, illegal move or legal move. That's about it. Uh, you don't have to detect winning or anything like that. Just a working chess implementation. So ever since I saw the, uh, that report about how brilliant this person was and to be fair, yeah, doing, doing graphics and AI and all that stuff, it was like 50,000 lines of assembly. I was like, holy smokes, dude, you wouldn't find me doing that. It's still impressive. I, w I want you guys to do something not impressive, <laughs> but you know, I'd like to see somebody do that at least. So, um, please post onto the chat channel after you watch this video, which of these four options you're going to do, uh, whoever, I guess, first come first serve on it. So, uh, it'll incentivize people. It'll reward people for, uh, doing the, uh, watching the video sooner rather than later, uh, before Thursday. So, uh, I guess there's limited slots available for each one of these, uh, options. So whoever watches last will get stuck doing open CV or something. Either way, none of these should be, none of these should actually be, um, that bad. Should be fun. A little hard but fun. And, um, if you do something impressive, you get lots of extra credit. Uh, typically in this class, there's a lot of extra credit given out. We do a Hufflepuff, Gryffindor, Slytherin, Ravenclaw sy house system. Tons of points are given out. The final project is usually an interpretive dance. You guys know going to do that. So here's this. And if you do something cool, I will toss extra credit points your way. Um, possibly in large enough numbers to matter to your overall grade. So, uh, yeah, that's it. And on uh, Thursday, we'll go over the final, um, oh, the, all right, the Jupiter Hub thing. Right, yes, that's another option. So, that's right. Don't let me forget about that. Berkeley set up a Jupiter Hub for us. Berkeley Data Science. And so, Motzenbacher, uh, one of my former TAs, uh, is going to do a, uh, um, a talk, extra credit talk on data science on Friday. So come to it, learn about data science, and you can feasibly pick this as your thing. So they set up this uh, Jupyter Hub for us. It's like a whole cloud computing thing, tons of CPU time available on it. I haven't done anything with it. So if somebody wants to play around with it and do some data science analysis stuff, doesn't have to be an assembly, obviously. It could be Python or whatever. Um, I will throw extra credit your way so that we can have something to report to Berkeley because they keep sending me these surveys like, so how's it working out for you? You know, it's the, it's the uh, two I two C thing. Pretty cool. Right. And I'm like, archive email, <laughs> archive email. Cause I've been really busy this semester and um, haven't done anything with it. So if somebody would like to do a, uh, if you, especially if you took Seaside 26 with me, Last semester, you know what I'm talking about, those Jupyter Hub things, the Python data science things. We'll get a data set in there for you and you'll analyze the data. And then that's it. And then we can report to Berkeley that we used their thing and it was, you know, cool or whatever. So that's the, uh, that's the thing. So let me bookmark that and so we can find that again. So that is, that is the fifth option. So there you go. So there's like 30 or something people in this class. Hopefully it'll be evenly distributed among these five options. I sort of suspect that it won't be because that's the way that human life is. But um, I think all of these are good final projects and uh, be aware that I'm very generous with X credit, especially towards the end of the semester. So uh, make sure you do it. Don't like a uh, punt on it. You know, just be like, yeah, my grade's good enough. I think it's zero. Because these are all really good for you. Physical computing. If you get good at physical computing, you can make stuff. And you can rip thermometer plates off the walls and have a Raspberry Pi controlling the weather in your house. Like a supervillain Frozen or something. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of really cool stuff you can do with physical computing. It's a giant field. The maker 
crowd is a lot of fun to hang out with. Uh, there are maker spaces when there's not a pandemic where you can go and build stuff and they've got tools and they've got components and you can craft things. Um, my daughter digs it. Uh, if you just borrow a laser cutter, you know, like you don't take it home, but like while you're there, they can laser cut things for you so you can make a, I don't know, car ramp that launches cars into the air or something. I don't know. Like model cars, not real cars. You know, there, there's just all, sky's the limit. Your imagination is the limit. And so that's a pretty expansive limit. Yeah. And your budget too. Your budget is also a limit. So if you've ever seen Mark Rober on uh, on YouTube, he's a uh, huge on this kind of stuff. Um, Mark Rober. He's a cool dude. My daughter loves watching his videos. The truth about my son, uh, squirrel. Yeah, sure. So he built a uh, he built a um, he built a uh, no yeah. no copyright <laughs> infringement. Um, he builds. He, like he built a, a basketball hoop that will adjust, you know, and so you can't miss. Or sorry, dartboard. He made a dartboard that you can't miss. The dartboard would always move, so you hit a bullseye. And uh, a, a bowling ball that after you throw it, you could steer with your body and the bowling ball would roll, you know, however you, you tilt your body and things like that. So he, he does a lot of this kind of stuff. And there's there's a, various different YouTubers that, that do cool maker projects like that that... Um, my daughter just loves watching, and we watch all of their videos. Um, sometimes involving uh, guinea pigs and things like that. So they they build these giant contraptions and things like that. Uh, open CV is huge. It'd be great for your career if you could have experience with Open CV. So machine learning in general is a hot field. That uh, if you know it, if you know machine learning, you know. Uh, OpenCV, or if you know AI, and there's a lot of buzzwords. Data science is also huge. If you got that on your resume, mm, it looks good. It looks good, and you can get a job, and it's fun. So, for example, in previous years, we had a student take a drone up and fly over Willow and uh, count the number of cars. Uh, they did it in partnership with the Fresno um, Department of Transportation, I think, something like that. I don't remember off the top of my head. But basically, it was like, could you have... Because right now, uh, the DOT moves these little cables across roads, like to do speed, like to see... Uh, they have to do a speed uh, survey every couple of years on every every major road to see how fast cars drive down it. And so uh, it'd be like, you know, it'd be cheaper having a drone. So you put a drone up there, just hovering in place, hopefully not burning too much power. And the drone just sits there and watches the cars and counts the number of cars that go past and gets their average speed, or you do a histogram of their, their speed, and then you don't have to have a crew running out there and putting a cable across the road, getting run over, and then sending back out to collect it a couple days later. You know, so it was a cool project. Um, we had another group work with uh, the Japanese gardens, uh, uh, filming the Japanese gardens using drones. Um, uh, another group did like an ad for some reason for like a window cleaning company or something. I don't know. Really know. So, uh, yeah, open CV, uh, fruit sorting. Uh, you can partner with a farmer and, uh, send drones out to scout their fields and see which orchards are ripe for the picking stuff like that. Uh, the mechatronics guy that we hired is a really cool dude. Uh, Matt, he, um, he got to start doing a uh, fruit sorting. So he built a automated fruit sorter. So fruit would come down a assembly line and it would look at the color of it and kick it out or reject it or sort it into ripe, not ripe, overripe. You know, I don't, I wasn't there, but that's, you know, you can do that with, with this and you control. It. So you have open CV connected to raspberry Pi, connected to, uh, actuators and you can sort fruit. And like, like I said, you know, sky is really the, the limit on this kind of stuff. So uh, bridges, uh, I think it'd be fun for you guys to make a game using the non-blocking O. I haven't touched the non-blocking O yet. I'd like to see somebody use the non-blocking O to do real-time stuff with bridges. It's really exciting. I just haven't done it yet, and I'd like one of you guys to figure it out. It's the end of your fourth semester. You should be able to dig into the documentation and make a project. 
chest and assembly. I've already talked about that. If it was good enough for a uh, press release at Cambridge, then uh, you know it'll look good on your resume. And then finally, like I said, the Berkeley Data Science. Data Science is hot, hot, hot right now. And the Berkeley people have set up our own cloud computing cluster with all these free credits of computing credits and I haven't used it and I'd like I'd like somebody to I'd like somebody to do it because uh, yeah it's the last week of school <laughs> and it's gonna go away so I'd like to have something I can I can talk to him about okay. so that is it for today guys uh, I will uh, not be in class tomorrow I'm gonna be in surgery so uh, wish me luck it's not serious at all um, I'm not worried I'm more annoyed by having to miss class than anything else. That's the worst part of it. So uh, I'll be back on Thursday. We'll go over the final review then. And if you guys have any questions about these options, let me know. All right, that's it for today. I'll see you guys later.